ತನ್ಮಾಮವಧು ತದ್ವಕ್ತಾರಮವಧು ಅವಧು ಮಾಂ ಅವಧು ವಕ್ತಾರಂ ಅವಧು ವಕ್ತಾರಂ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 So this is Anushtub, basically what we know as Shloka 8888. Ah, Chiketana Sukratu Devau Marta Reshadasa Varuna Yartha Beshase Dadhita Prayase Mahe Tahikshatram Avihrutam Samyak ಅಸೂರ್ಯಾಂ ಆಶತೆ ಅಧಾವ್ರೇವ ಮಾನುಷಾಂ ಸುವರ್ಣಧಾಯಿ ದರ್ಶತ ತಾಂಷೆ ರಥಾನ ಉರ್ವೀಂಗವ್ಯೂತಿಂ ಎಷಾಂ ರಾತಹವ್ಯಸ ಸುಷ್ಟುತಿ ದೃಕ್ ಸೋಮೈ ಮನಾಮಹೆ ಅಧಾಹಿ ಕಾವ್ಯ ಯುವಾಂ ದಕ್ಷಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಭೀಹ್ ಅದ್ಭುತ ನಿಕೇತು ನಾನ ಚಿಕೇತ್ ಹೇ ಪೂತ ದಕ್ಷಸ ತದ್ರಿತ ಪೃಥ್ವಿ ಬೃಹತ್ ಶ್ರವಾ ಎಷ ಋಷೀನ ಜ್ರಯಸ ಅರಂ ಪೃಥು ಅತಿಕ್ಷರಂತಿ ಯಾಮಭೀಹ್ ಆಯದ್ವಾಂ ಈಹ್ಯತ್ ಚಕ್ಷಸ ಮಿತ್ರಾವಯಂ ಚ ಸೂರ್ಯ ವ್ಯಚಿಷ್ಟ ಬಹುಪಾಯೇ ಯಥೇಮಹಿ ಸ್ವರಾಜೇ ದಿಸ್ ವನ್ ಯು ಲಿಸನ್ ಟು ದ ಟ್ಯಾಪಸ್ಟ್ರಿ ಆಫ್ ಸೌಂಡ್ಸ್ ಯು ಫೀಲ್ ವಾಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎನ್ what a high intelligence is there behind you know it's not just uh, random words they are put into into this kind of sound a specific sound of beauty and when you read it clearly uh, in the proper accentuation of udatta you could uh, sense the meaning so Uh, this is the introduction by Sri Aurobindo to this hymn, The Givers of Self-Rule. The Rishi invokes Varuna, the vast form of the truth, and Mitra, the beloved, godhead of its harmonies and large bliss of the truth's harmonies, who conquer for us the perfect force of and our true and infinite being they are the conquerors they conquer for us our true being to change our imperfect human nature into the image of their divine workings this is basically what sacrifice is doing then the solar heaven solar heaven of the truth is manifested within us its wide pasture of herding illuminations becomes the field of journeying of our chariots the high thoughts of the seers their purified discernment their rapid inspirations become ours our very earth becomes the world of that vast truth for then there is the perfect movement the transcendence of this darkness of sin and suffering we arrive at self empire a rich full and vast possession of our infinite being this is absolutely vedic
Yeah, it's beautiful. It's um, it's like poetry. Mm. Yeah, the sacrifice. We we will get this taste. What the sacrifice is about? Slowly, we're reading Vedas more and more. After that, there is no return. You know that we will want only this. Mm. Kind of um, a very intoxicating. All right. So interpretation. Varun and Mitra are the powers of the dynamic truth whose habitation and the birth place is Svar, the region between our human intelligence and the supermind. Basically, it is the ray of the sun, as we discussed this, yeah, three rochanas, right? these over mental mm -hmm. realms, uh, which mm -hmm. connect transcendental to our manifestation. They represent the luminous worlds of Svar, the world of the rays of the sun. The dynamism of these planes can change our human dynamic nature into the divine nature. It is because of this attempt to pass beyond these higher dynamic regions and to go straight to the absolute that the transformation of human nature started to be seen as impossible. And this was the meaning of the famous dialogue between Indra and Agastya, we already mentioned this before, who tried to overpass mm, the regions of Svara and to go straight to the Absolute, where Indra explained to him that he was actually his friend and should not be neglected. And here I give a reference from the Secret of the Veda on this passage. Uh, the governing idea of the hymn, and this is kind of interesting for us to read it from Sri Aurobindo, of the hymn of this Indra and Agastya, where, as you remember, Agastya tried to bypass Indra with his Marats and to go into the transcendental. And Indra stops him and says that uh, we should not go there because there is nothing there for you to know. But uh, that force wants to manifest here. So better we kindle here the fire and, you know, commit to the sacrifice, to this transformational work together. And Agastya agrees. He changes his mind. This is a very uh, unusual thing for Rishis. Rishis usually don't change their mind so easily. Agastya actually changed his mind twice. The, this is a unique Rishi. By the way, he is also Maitra Varuni. His parents is Mitra and Varuna. There are two Rishis in the Rigveda who have uh, these uh, parents. That is Vasishtha and uh, Agastya Rishi. They are both Maitra Varuni. And if I may ask, what is the, why, I guess the question would be, of course, why? Or what is the symbolic uh, uh, meaning behind that? Well, they are their parents, or they are the source of their uh, inspiration, or the source of their uh, you know, connection to their spiritual uh, fulfillment. So they are the kind of introducing these powers into our life, into the life of humanity. These are the agents of those forces, uh, which make these forces known to us through their own realization. It's like uh, these are the involutionary beings, the avatars yeah, of these forces. The rishis are involutionary beings. They bring those devatas into action here among us. They represent them somehow. And of course we call them their parents, but that is um, a traditional way of looking at it. Uh, the origin of to which gotra you belong. There are many gotras. Rishis have their own. Uh, rishis are uh, the, uh, how to say, the expressions of that of those forces 
expressions in terms of language, in terms of uh, mantra, uh, hymns. Yeah? They create hymns which connect us who would repeat these hymns to those forces. Uh, so the governing idea of the hymn belongs to a stage of spiritual progress when the human soul wishes by the sheer force of thought to hasten forward beyond in order to reach prematurely the source of all things without full development of the being in all its progressive stages of conscious activity. Sri Aurobindo is so precise. It's really all our desires of getting mukti are really this premature um, desire. Premature because we didn't yet earn this, you know, full consciousness. So we want to get out of this prison before we are totally developed. We do not realize that this prison is nothing but the conditions for our development. And as long as we are using these obstacles as the, or challenges as the uh, indicators, as the as indicators for our development, then um, if we don't use them as the indicators, if we are not happy to meet these obstacles because they are showing us where we have to strengthen our consciousness and develop ourselves, if we want to run away from them, then of course we are looking for mukti. Mukti without changing ourselves. So look how beautifully he says, to hasten forward beyond in order to reach prematurely the source of all things without full development of the being in all its progressive stages of conscious activity. Very precise. The effort is opposed by the gods who preside over the universe of man and of the world and a violent struggle takes place in the human consciousness between the individual soul in its egoistic eagerness and the universal powers which seek to fulfill the divine purpose of the cosmos, nakshatras, devatas. The seer Agastya at such a moment confronts in, its, in his inner experience Indra, Lord of Svar, the realm of pure intelligence through which the ascending soul passes into the divine truth. Indra speaks first of that unknowable source of things towards which Agastya is too impatiently striving so to the transcendental, yes? And he says to him, that is not to be found in time. That is not to be found in time. It does not exist in the actualities of the present, nor in the eventuality of the future. It neither is now, nor becomes hereafter. Its being is beyond space and time and therefore in itself cannot be known by that which is in space and time. And since um, Agastya Rishi wanted to know that uh, and all his aspiration to know was built from the mind which is in space and time, Indra tells him when you come there you would not even know what you, what you are looking for. It manifests itself by its forms and activities in the consciousness of that which is not itself. And through those activities it is meant that it should be realized. This is the message which is given in the first shloka of this hymn. So it is, look at this beautiful, now all this is realized, so manifests, it manifests itself 
by its forms and activities in the consciousness of that which is not itself. So it real kind of manifests itself in consciousness of another, in the otherness of self. And though, and though, and sorry, and through those activities, it is meant that it should be realized. It is meant to be realized through the consciousness of the other. So this is the sacrifice. And because it is consciousness of the other, we want to leave it. We want to go to the source where we are ourselves. But, um, but there is no way. So, but if one tries to approach it and study it in itself, that transcendental, it disappears from the thought that would seize it and is as if it were not. So to go there and to hope to understand, to know it is impossible. This is one of the hymns, 170 of the first mandala. You can check mm. this short dialogue between Agastya Rishi and Indra. Yeah, um, Vlad, I, I find that particular piece you just read to be, well, of course, it's extremely profound. Um, it's very interesting because what I hear there is this idea of development of what he was calling progressive stages of conscious activity. Um, the becoming, which of course, Vedanta has, um, let's say, issue with in one way. Um, and yet, when I read these words, you hear what you were just saying. Um, and to me, it invokes still this idea of something we've been discussing, thoughts that have been on my mind of how that karma is nature. And nature is karma, meaning that to reach for that that one is not uh, prepared for, of which one is prematurely uh, searching for, is to try to pull oneself out of nature. Mm, exactly. Yeah, and and to try to extract oneself, to try to um, well, to extract oneself, because there's nowhere to go. Right. Uh, the, the goal itself is out of space and time. There's not, it's not a, a place to go to, which, of course, in Vedanta, Swami Dayananda used to speak about this consistently, um, you know, this idea of heaven um, and, uh, and what heaven means to different people. Um, and that well, the way people speak about heaven is that it is, it is this place in space and time, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, I when I when I hear this, I, I am struck once again with this idea of the nature of well, the nature of nature, the way it is that this relates to karma, and the way it is that when we're discussing swar in the intermediary zone um, that must be employed, it then of course brings up questions in my mind, though, of um, if Swar is in between the transcendental, if Swar is in between the, the Vijnana and the, and the Bhu, in between the earth and, and, and that that is transcendental, does, <clears throat> does time work the same way there? And is it such that, as we have heard many times, and that people somehow are able to quickly bypass through, through the intermediary of a luminous being who resides in Swa? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and therefore, since the goal is out of time and space, uh, does this becoming uh, need necessarily be do we understand truly how much time that takes? Mm. If you understand what I mean by that. Um, 
And that, but what I'm hearing from you, ob, ob, the obvious here in terms of the Veda is that what you're saying is that the sacrifice um, to or, or through the sacrifice to the intermediary of Swar is the answer. Sacrifice is uh, the only reason, a reasonable answer because um, if uh, we are here just to live, and uh, Shirobindo says uh, about this kind of you know, hasty, premature, uh, how to say, uh, uh, escape. He calls it escape. You know? Escape brings not uh, the victory and the crown. This is the line from Savitri. So escape brings not the victory and the crown. There's something uh, in this world that you came to do, you know. And there's the whole passage in Sarge is so beautiful. Um, I, I will open it because it, it is just on the topic. When, we, when it comes to that moment, when the topic is clear, then one second, um, it's very fast. Um, the escape brings not the victory and the crown. Um, let me find it. Um, oh, maybe not simply escape. Escape brings. Can I find it? Ah, yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, this is um, just look at this passage. Um, when he, uh, Adoration of the Divine Mother, Canto 2, Book um, 3, uh, when uh, Ashwapati realizes the stillness, absolute, incommunicable, where it meets the sheer self-discovery of the soul, a wall of stillness shuts it from the world, a gulf of stillness swallows up the sense, it is the experience, huh? and makes unreal all that mind has known and all the laboring senses still would weave prolonging an imaged unreality. And he continues and only in, inconceivable in, is left, only the nameless without space and time abolished is the burdening need of life. Thought falls from us, we cease from joy and grief. The ego is dead. This is Mukti. We are freed from being and care. We have done with birth and death and work and fate. Done, finished. And then he hears voice. O soul, it is too early to rejoice. Thou has reached the boundless silence of the self. Thou has leaped into a glad divine abyss. But where hast thou thrown self's mission and self's power? On what dead bank on the eternal's road? Dead bank on the eternal's road. One was within thee, who was self and world. One was within thee, who was self and world. What hast thou done for his purpose in the stars? Are these stars for nothing? This beauty of cosmos is just to escape. Escape brings not the victory and the crown. Something thou camest to do from the unknown, but nothing is finished, and the world's, world goes on, because only half God's cosmic work is done. This is half work. You came back. It's half work. Only the everlasting no has neared and stared into thy eyes and killed thy heart. But where is the lover's everlasting yes? 
and immortality in the secret heart. The voice that chants to the creative fire, the symboled om, the great ascending word, the bridge between the rapture and the calm, the passion and the beauty of the bride, the chamber where the glorious enemies kiss. A smile that saves the golden peak of things. This too is truth at the mystic fount of life. A black veil has been lifted. We have seen the mighty shadow of the omniscient Lord. But who has lifted up the veil of light? And who has seen the body of the king? The mystery of God's birth and acts remains, leaving unbroken the last chapter's seal, unsolved the riddle of the unfinished play. The cosmic player laughs within his mask. And still the last inviolate secret hides behind the human glory of a form, behind the gold eidolon of a name. This is Sri Urban. Straight. That, that's just, <laughs> that's just, that's just, my, I get chills. That's just gorgeous. It's really something, all right. True, direct. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Vlad. That that was so apropos and so perfect and mm. wow. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Uh, so the whole uh, this is the text which I was writing to this hymn. Um, maybe I will skip it to it with all these regions of the mind. Maybe I will go straight to Sri Aurobindo, writes in his letter to the disciple. The fundamental difference is in the teaching that there is a dynamic divine truth, the supermind. Now, when we, you say that there is no time, yes, there is no time, but there is a notion of the dynamic truth, rhythm. Uh, there is something going on there within. Something, something is brooding, something is differentiating, distinguishing itself in some way. And that is the dynamic truth. And it's not the static truth of the being, transcendental. It is that uh, in the process of manifesting or creating the world, truth with force and consciousness working together. Uh, and this notion or this concept of the dynamic truth disappears in the post-Vedic literature. You will not find it. There is no difference between satyam and naritam anymore. Yeah, they are total synonyms. But in the Veda, they are two fundamentals, very different. Uh, <clears throat> so here he says about this, that there is a dynamic divine truth, the supermind, and that into the present world of ignorance and that truth can descend. And that into the present world of ignorance that truth can descend, create a new truth consciousness and divinize life. It can divinize the, the, the nature and that is the sacrifice. It, it knows how to do it. It has all the, the, the tools, all the knowledge of the dynamic transformation. It's not a static truth. The old yogas go straight from mind to the absolute divine. Regard all dynamic existence as ignorance, illusion, that means maya, or lila. When you enter the static and immutable divine truth, they say, you pass out of cosmic existence. And they are totally right. You really pass out. But as Shubindu says, escape brings not the victory and the crown. You just go out. You return to the place where you always belonged. 
as he says, the heaven we always possessed. It's earth we never possessed. We never uh, could colonize the earth with the spirit. But the heaven, it is our, our place where we are coming from. So when we return home, so what's the point was of coming here then? What was there a point to come here if you want to return home only? There is a big question of us coming here for some reason. Well, it's only person who has that realization already, who sees our home, you know, who has it already realized, can speak this way, of course. Um, all right, I can take a second one. Oh, it is for Achiketana Sukratu Devau Marta Rishada Sa Varunaya Arta Vesha Seda Dhita Praya Semahe. It's only first shloka. We didn't read any shloka yet. Oh, I, I just made wrong move. Wait a minute. We read it. Yeah. Well, you read the, yeah. You I read the entire, the entire hymn. Right. Tahikshatram avihrutam samyak asuriyam ashate adhavrate vamanusham suvarna dhaye darshatam. For it is they who attain to the undistorted force and the entire mightiness. Then shall thy humanity become as if the workings of these gods. It is as if the visible heaven of light were founded in thee. For these two are representatives of the dynamic truth, who have access to the perfect power of the self, which is undistorted force, asuriyam, Avihrutam, the undistorted kshatram power, mighty Asuriyam. So they have it, Ashate, they realize this force, it is theirs. It is by that force that our humanity can become the fields of their workings. Manusham can become suvarna, as if svar, as if heaven. It is as if heaven itself becomes founded here in us, fully visible darshatam, dai, becomes established and visible or beautiful. So suvar itself becomes established within our being, within our humanity. Manusham. I don't know, nobody speaks this language um, afterwards. Even Upanishads do not speak this language. Uh, they don't dare somehow. Or maybe they still have something to do before this becomes obvious to them. Glad, when you say they don't speak this language, can you explain to me? I think I know what you mean, but I met, but um, can you clarify that? Yeah, I mean this daring language of establishing heaven in our humanity, or you know, uh, kind of bringing down the the power uh, which is uh, undistorted and uh, mighty. Uh, into our humanity would be a little bit too daring or too, would be seen as egoistic or something. Yeah? Uh, but when you are an evolutionary being, if you are an avatar, you know, you can say it. Uh, if, uh, if you have already realized your heaven or your, uh, to say, transcendental being, and you are looking at this manifestation as the aim, and then, of course, it is very different. So you're looking upside down, as it were. Your, your uh, heaven is your home, 
and earth is your uh, aim, yeah? your heaven. Chikandogya, I was mentioning already, which uh, says very interestingly about uh, humans and the gods, that for human beings, the uh, earth is earth and heaven is heaven, and for the gods, the heaven is, is earth, and earth is heaven. And uh, this gives us a sense of uh, how Rishis look at it. Yeah? Rishis look with this look where the heaven is earth for them and earth is heaven. They are all oriented for this manifestation of the divine in time and space. This is the, the most beautiful challenge they could have, the divine could have to manifest to, I don't know how to say, to, uh, to manifest in all the details, infinite details, his own being. It can be done only in time and space, where there is no repetition of the being. Yeah? So he, in his transcendental state, also does not repeat himself. He is never boring to himself. He is infinite in his existence and his consciousness. Means that there is no repetition. Uh, and when you come into manifestation of time and space, you have the same. There is no repetition. <laughs> every detail, every single smallest uh, event is unique in time and space. That is the sign of infinity entering or building in the time and space. Yeah? That's why like, uh, the same matter cannot occupy the same space. Or how, to, how somebody said, you remember there was a movie uh, that uh, only one matter can occupy one space. Matter and space somehow they are connected. The being in space, infinite, never repeating itself. Well, when you said that, I, I thought of breath. The in-breath and the out-breath. Um, on the one hand, it never repeats itself, and yet on the other hand, it's all cyclical. Yeah. Well, Possibly way that our DNA, possibly in a helix kind of fashion. Yeah, I meant uh, the, uh, it never repeats itself for 100%. Of course, structures are there, mind is there, cycles are there, everything is there, which shows, uh, uh, which points to repetition. You know? But at the same time, there is never the same, I don't know, fingerprint or... Uh, Babel on the show, you will not find. Uh, you will not find the same. And I'm sure even on the level of subatomic particles, will, there will be always some, some difference. Of course, our mind uh, draws pictures and makes all these geometrical figures, perfect, uh, you know, circles and uh, perfect uh, uh, squares and triangles, which are which do not exist in nature, but our mind can create it. You know, can. But even then, are they created at the same time? Yeah, but if you enlarge, 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 you will see that they are different, that they don't have the same sharp corners, one to one matching. There will be never, because the same matter cannot occupy the same space. That's what they call marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyhow, these are profound thoughts about our creation, what it is about. And it's kind of spelling out the infinite um, here. And, uh, and of course, and you are studying the, the 
the laws of existence uh, in Jyotisha, yeah? you want to see the patterns and the, and, and the uh, system which will help us to understand what is to happen. But it will never be the same as you know. Yeah? You cannot 100% know. You can know 99.9% yeah? or something. No, never, never that much. Yeah. So, and, and, and each individual, even there's like a fingerprint, but each individual, even each individual horoscope in its basic form, not the details of it, but its basic form won't repeat itself, but it's like every, maybe like every 30,000 years. But even then, the exact... That's just the position of the of the grahas, the position of the planets. But then, then after that, you have all the individuation that happens within that rising sign and so forth and so on. Everything else is different. So you're totally correct there. Yeah, it should be like this. Otherwise, it would not make sense that in infinity, uh, you know, manifested would just suddenly will be repeated in some forms or and sometimes. Uh, this would uh, would be very weird if the repetition could be done or the uh, cloning. I do not know about cloning. Uh, is it real? Is it truly? No, it's not the same thing. No, it's very different being. Um, and anyhow, these are thoughts. Yeah, okay, so maybe we stop here for today and um, we will pick up from the shloka number three next time. From here. Okay. Uh, this one is also something rather heavier. It is the name of the Rishi. Uh, it is him who is... Uh, who receives bounteous offerings, Rata Havya. And it's also very beautiful, maybe I will read it once before we close. Tavam Eshera Thanam Urvim Gaviutim Esham Rata Havya Syasushtutim Tadhrik Stomai Manamahe. Therefore, you, O oh gods, I desire for the rushing of these chariots your wide pasture of the herds. Forcefully, by our hymns, our minds seize on this perfect affirmation. When the gods receives, when the god receives our bounteous offering, forcefully by our hymns, our minds seize on the perfect affirmation. This is what is the technique, the technology of the hymn. What it is doing, it is forcefully. Uh, the mind is forcefully seize, seizing upon uh, this perfect affirmation, holds on to this word, onto this hymn, and, and it creates this change, the birth of the devata in us. We have to hold with our mind, we have to fix our mind upon the him upon the vision, the word, and it will reveal its visions and secrets and revelations. Uh, all right, we can stop here. I will close with the mantra. Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina Sarve Santo Niramaliha Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Makashchit Dukha Bhavet Om Shanti 
Shanti, Shanti. Adio. All right. See you then. Thank you so much, Vlad. It's very inspiring. I'm very happy. Yeah. Very good to see you. Bye. Okay. Bye bye.